I'm going to give a short talk here about rotations and diatomics. The important points of this lecture are energies and degeneracies for rotation. We'll include some pictures and some topics that have been part of other presentations. So uh, remember we talked about the idea that the moment of inertia is actually a tensor. Now we can always choose a set of axes A, B, or C such that the off-diagonal elements are equal to zero. In this case, I could pretty simply do that as, um, and I'm not going to try to figure out which one's A, B, or C, but for benzene, it happens that I believe that the X, Y, and Z coordinates do make a good set of axes. In other molecules and structures, we have to find other uh, ways to find that. For a diatomic molecule, like carbon monoxide, this becomes really easy. There are two equivalent axes of rotation. In this case, it's going to be the Y, it can rotate around the Y axis or the Z axis. So we're just going to treat this as a simple rotor in one dimension. So let's set up the Schrodinger equation. We previously showed that the kinetic energy operator in this situation is going to be equal to minus h bar squared over 2 mu del squared. Now, turns out there's no potential energy, so that makes things a little bit simpler. The Hamiltonians only includes that term, so it's just equal to minus h bar squared over 2 mu del squared. In Cartesian coordinates, that looks pretty simple, but the problem's insolvable, so we can't use those. Instead, we're going to use spherical polar coordinates. In this case, we have this fairly complicated expression, which includes the angular momentum operator squared and multiple references to the bond length. Now, we're going to go with what's called a rigid rotor approximation. That is, that the uh, molecule is going to be rotating, is, is actually vibrating much faster than it rotates. So it's rotating like this, it's vibrating like this. So the essentially as it's moving, it looks like it's a constant uh, distance. So if R is fixed, then all the terms in R disappear and the Schrodinger equation becomes as we've given this right here. I have, so uh, the wave function are the spherical harmonics Y, J, M sub J. I get an eigenfunction, which of course must be the energy, h bar squared over 2 mu, um, r minus 2 j, j plus 1, and multi where j is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3. And um, in the vibrational ground state, uh, it's just going to be equal to h bar squared over 2i, uh, j, j plus 1, or b, e, or b is the rotational constant, j, j plus 1. Uh, I is equal to mu, uh, the moment of inertia, excuse me, uh, I is the moment of inertia, which is just the reduced mass times R squared. So this is actually fairly simple. Now, um, again, rotational constants typically expressed in wave numbers. So if I multiply this by HC, so E is equal to H nu is equal to HC of lambda is equal to HC nu. Actually, I have to, what I have to do is I have to divide the number by HC. And now what I get is that H bar over four pi C mu RE squared. This of course is the moment of inertia. We have state degeneracies. So m sub j is that we, we have j is 0, 1, 2, 3. We have m sub j goes from minus j to plus j in intervals of 1. Each j state has two j plus 1 orientations in space. We did this diagram in a previous lecture on angular momentum. What this is is the radius is equal to, this is for l equals 2 or j equals 2 in this case. And so <clears throat> the, this is going to be j, j plus 1 square root of times h bar or square root of 6 
h bar is the radius. The various values of the z component of each vector are 2 h bar, h bar, 0 h bar, minus h bar, minus 2 h bar. So that's this value right here. And so what we see is that the angular momentum vector must be somewhere in the cone formed by those two values, by the length and the z component. The 2j plus 1 orientations, we need to keep this in mind that there's a degeneracy involved with this. My energies, uh, I'm just diagramming these. These are now diagrammed to scale. And what we'll see later is that the allowed transitions are delta j equal to plus or minus 1. So if I'm looking at absorption, what am I going to see? I'm going to see a, uh, and by the way, because of the Boltzmann distribution, all of the, many of these states are going to be thermally populated. That's the topic of another lecture. We will see transitions of 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 7. Well, what do those give me? So what are we going to see if I plot absorbance versus the photon energy? Well, the first transition I'm going to see is at 2 Be. The next one is going to be at 4 Be, 6 minus 2. The next one is going to be at 6 minus 12, or 6 Be. The next one at 8 Be, because we're looking at the difference in energies between these states. What do I see? I see a series of lines. separated by two times the rotational constant. Remember, the rotational constant gives me information on the bond length. And so if I can look at, if I can look at these series of lines and just simply find out the sp spacing between those to a zero order approximation, this can be two times the rotational constant. I can just now take that number, get the rotational constant, and get the bond uh, get the bond length out. Okay, the spherical harmonics are rotation the rotational wave functions. We've seen these before for uh, for the uh, atom. The first one y zero zero is just constant, and that's interesting. I'm going to think about that for a moment. It has it's equally acceptable to find the molecule at any orientation in space. Um, in fact, it's, that is one reason why rotation, the energy, zero energy for rotation is zero. There's no zero point energy. Why? Because I can't really measure the, um, the orientation of the molecule. It's, it's not set. Um, I mean, I measure it, I'll find some value, but um, there's no angular dependence to this term. Uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, mi 1, minus 1. Notice that m, m sub j, this is a e to the minus m sub j phi, i m sub j phi, is, the, is where the m sub j quantum number comes in. It does not come in in the energy, but it does come in in the wave functions. So these are the complex forms of the wave functions. I've got some pictures here. Uh, again, Wikipedia proves pretty pretty useful. So these are a few uh, for those of you who've looked. At, so these are the real functions. These are if I I can take linear combinations of plus and minus, and I can get the real functions. And yes, these are what the S, P, D, and F orbitals look like. If you wanted to do G, H, and I orbitals, those are what they would look like too. Uh, they're not very important for G, H, and I orbitals aren't very important. F orbitals aren't really very important in chem, but as rotational wave functions, they are important. We're not going. We're not going to label them that way, though. In this case.